Sure, you remember the first person to step onto the moon, but do you remember the last one to stand on its dusty, cratered surface? No? Well, it was Apollo 17's commander Gene Cernan, and the year was 1972. But who would be the next person to walk on our natural satellite? Wait, are we going back to the moon, you're asking? Well, it would seem so. The moon is again in our eye like a big pizza pie, but now it includes visions of lunar homesteading and colonies, and it's not the U.S. that's going. This time, the hardware is coming from China. That country already has two robots on the moon and more to come. And meanwhile, Europeans are partnering with Russia to assess settlement possibilities. In fact, the only developed country that doesn't seem to have our pockmarked satellite in its crosshairs is the U.S. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, well, it may not be a race this time, but the moon still has what it takes to galvanize national space agencies. It is the go-to destination for the next generation of space programs. The motivations are scientific, utilitarian, but in the case of China, are they also strategic? And while it's one thing to go to the moon, it's another to stay in its bone-dry environment. Yet, there may be a way to coax a veritable faucet of H2O from its surface. And what about the ethical factors? Planetary protection regulations guard against biological contamination. But what about the byproducts of commercialization? Imagine the light of the moon tinged with the glow of neon hotel signs emanating from its craters. Can we stop it? It's the crater good. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. I know. You're thinking, been there, done that. We long ago checked the moon off our list of planetary bodies to visit, and many American space enthusiasts have swung their gaze to Mars. But some countries still have an itch to go lunar. Indeed, the fact that Americans have been to the moon may be all the more incentive to go themselves. The China National Space Administration has two robots on the moon now. We'll find out what China is planning to send up next, and later in the show we'll address speculation about the strange sound that Apollo 10 astronauts heard while orbiting the moon. Was it alien music? Well, not to give too much away, but let's just say we can put to rest the idea that the Chinese plans for going to the moon include a rendezvous with extraterrestrials. What are the ambitions of China's space agency? Their Chang'e 3 spacecraft and the U-2 rover are kicking up lunar dust as we speak. And China is thinking about being the first country to land a probe on the far side of the moon in 2018. James Oberg is a former NASA rocket scientist and a self-identified space enthusiast. He addresses the Chinese motivation behind these scientific and technical feats and whether they include military goals and if they will prompt the U.S. to revise its space ambitions. I mean, doesn't watching the U-2 rover on the moon make us just a little nostalgic? They've got one lander and a rover that came off of that, not quite the size of a golf cart, but a substantial size. And it's a very respectable achievement for their first time out. They were disappointed that it, it jammed, the wheels jammed after a couple of weeks on the moon. But all in all, for a first time out of the gate, an amazingly high level of technology. Okay, and it also means, of course, since you can't use a parachute to any great effect on the airless moon, uh, they, they've got to have some sort of soft landing technique. To me, that sounds like they've got to have special rockets or something. I mean, how do you, how do you land something on the moon these days? Landing on the moon is a challenge of rocket power and guidance. As you slow yourself down, no air drag, no parachutes, no, no gliding. You have to reach a zero altitude and a zero speed at the same time. And doing it both at the same time is, is the only way to succeed. They did it on their first attempt, and no one else has ever done it on their first attempt. It sounds like uh, there's no lack of competence there, at least. The Chinese space engineers 
through case after case have shown coming out of the gate with new technologies, a new rendezvous, new spacewalks from, from their spacecraft, have uh, clearly studied Western experience, Soviet experience, Russian experience, and taken full advantage of it. I wish we studied our own past and our own lessons as thoroughly as they clearly have. Maybe you could give me a little bit more detail on, on the things that are on the moon that uh, have the uh, Chinese flag on them. They're the Chang-1, Chang-2, Chang-3, and now the U-2 rover. Uh, what are these guys doing other than making pictures? There are two probes are sent to orbit the moon and photograph the surface. They are both finished. Actually, one of them headed off for interplanetary space when it was done on the moon. There is one lander on the moon, the carrier, the platform that brought it down to the surface, lowered a ramp, and this little moon jeep trundled off. They call it Lunar Rabbit uh, from, from Chinese mythology. It went uh, a few hundred meters. It did have a problem with its uh, transmission and stopped, but it is still functioning, even though it's been surviving through the very cold lunar night and the warm-up and the very hot day. The probe is actually still sending very high-quality photographs. More than that, measuring the environment of the surface and measuring the environment underneath it, sounding it with... Uh, with radar down several hundred meters into the lunar dirt, seeing different layers that were put down over billions of years by eruptions and, and impacts and other kinds of lunar geology. So it's a very uh, sophisticated uh, and productive probe for a first time. Okay, putting something on the moon, that, that, that's obviously admirable. Uh, getting something back off the moon, it's the return ticket. It's always the expensive one, it seems, when you talk about space. They haven't done that, and yet they are talking about a sample return from the moon, are they not? One of the next steps, they say, will be a sample return, but that requires a bigger lander with a rocket to head back toward the Earth. It requires a, a collection mechanism. The Russians use drills and they use robot arms uh, to get several small samples back. The Chinese appear to want to one-up the Russians by doing it perhaps on the backside of the moon, uh, on areas of the moon that uh, no one's ever been to, no astronauts, and certainly no Soviet rovers and robots were there. It might have geology somewhat different than the front side. And of course, it would be a greater challenge. You'd need a relay satellite to stay in touch with it. But if it succeeds, it would be something that the Chinese could particularly point to, no one else has ever done. They're probably tired of being accused of simply retreading the space race in the 60s. To a large degree, people have sort of sniffed at their program as doing nothing that the U.S. and the Russians hadn't already done generations ago. Well, they're at the point now of starting to do new stuff, stuff that no one else in the world has gotten around to. And it's definitely going to get the world's attention, and that's their purpose. Well... I, I think it's a common reaction to anything involving China and high tech or scientific accomplishment to tie it into questions of national security. Are, are there military benefits for China, you know, making this effort to get to the moon? The moon, perhaps less so, but the ability to go to the moon has a significant military potential, not potential, but uh, implications, because the technology required to operate in deep space like that, long distances, long durations. You can use that for other spacecraft that you would be using closer to Earth for defense-related missions. And as we discovered during the space race, during the moon race, it's not just a matter of the prize is not just the moon rocks you bring back. The prize is the, the world renown that your technology uh, either acquires or, in our case, reacquires after having lost it to the Soviet Union for several years. And that kind of renown, that kind of respect has profound diplomatic and military and commercial uh, and scientific implications that rebounded tremendously to the advantage of the United States. The Chinese have studied that. They've studied our program and our results of our program, the benefits from it, the mistakes we made, uh, far better, I think, than our own people ever have. And they've concluded that they're playing on that stage and they're leading in particular areas of that stage is going to be of a tremendous importance to their country in the future. Well, uh, I, I kind of wonder whether this will have then some effect on the U.S. space program, because we're not planning to go back to the moon, at least no plans I've heard of. NASA has talked about going to Mars, maybe put humans on the red planet by 2030. But if the Chinese are successful in their moon program, uh, could that be a springboard, as it were, for you know Congress getting more interested in the U.S. going back to the moon? 
We're looking back at the space race of when uh, you and I were kids, and the idea was then that there was a goal, a ribbon at the end of one particular racetrack, and both countries, uh, the Soviet Union and the U.S., were heading for that, and one or the other country could win, and we did. But now there are too many racetracks out there. There are many different routes, and just getting to the moon to uh, do flags and footprints again, which is the the way it's often kind of sneered at, uh, would no longer have the impact and no longer have the justification for the budgets. But getting there and doing other things out there, doing things perhaps in partnership uh, with other countries, not so much to uh, benefit from their technology, but to get a good look at their technology and also to keep track of them to make sure they're not doing anything else sneaky. There are values to doing those kind of things. But as far as uh, dropping the flag at the Indy 500 and, and off we go on another race to a particular single goal. I don't see that ever happening again, or, or, or should it? Jim Oberg, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. James Oberg is a retired NASA rocket scientist. Well, it sounds as if there are many reasons that China wants to go to the moon, and national pride is clearly an important one. Of course, we Americans know something about that. But as James Oberg points out, you know, going to the moon is not necessarily a step into the solar system on the way to Mars, for example. And, and maybe going back to the moon for the U.S. is not something we should be doing. Well, speaking of the U.S., brings us to Apollo and to NASA's recently released audio of the exchange that Apollo 10 astronauts had while orbiting the moon. They heard what they described as, well, weird outer space type music. Now, the transcripts of this discussion have been public since 2008, but the release of the audio made its way to the Science Channel's Unexplained series. And as you can imagine, conspiracy theories now abound. Were the astronauts listening to the music of extraterrestrials? Yeah, well, uh, of course, what is the music of extraterrestrials? There's no top 40 radio station that plays that. So I don't even know what alien music sounds like, let alone weird outer space alien music. What, what exactly did they hear? Uh, well, it was kind of a whistling sound, you know. Is something a little bit strange, and they were hearing it inside uh, the spacecraft. Of course, they you know wasn't coming from outside. In, in in space, nobody can hear your music. Wait, it wasn't coming from outside the spacecraft. The signals were, but they were hearing it on their radio. So the question was, you know, what was it? And honestly, they were flying in formation with the lander. Okay, so that means you had two transmitters fairly close to one another in space. And anybody who's driven across the country late at night listening to AM radio knows that if you close to two stations, you hear the interference of their carriers. This is called heterodyning. It's all very technical, but it just means you, you get this, this sort of wobbly whistling sound. I bet that's what it was. You don't think it was the aliens whistling? Of course, they would need lips to whistle or play the flute. Well, it doesn't mean they have lips. It just means that they have a respiratory system. Maybe they can whistle without lips. up. Imagine your great, great, great grandchildren taking panoramic selfies with the Earth in the background. They might just do that if the European Space Agency gets its way and builds a moon colony. A geologist provides a checklist of what they'd need to do it next. It's the Crater Good on Big Picture Science. The Chinese may be the next ones to send hardware moonward, but meanwhile, other nations are thinking about sending people eventually. The 22 countries that make up the European Space Agency, ESA, have expressed interest in creating a moon base by 2030, and they're partnering with Russia to explore this possibility. But as we heard, the U.S. is not part of the plan. That bums out geologist Clive Neal at the University of Notre Dame. He attended the ESA meeting in December 2015, where the ambitious plans of the Europeans were being outlined. 
But as a geologist, he also sees the considerable amount of groundwork such efforts would require. I mean, there are checklists, and there are checklists. Imagine setting off on the family camping trip, for example, and forgetting basic items. Next thing you know, you're shivering under a blanket of leaves on the cold, hard ground and eating unreconstituted mashed potatoes. Mmm. And the, the moon is farther away than even the farthest national park, about 100 times farther. So there's no running to a five and dime for blankets or water. Are there five and dimes anymore? Well, at any rate, we need to attend to the needs of basic survival. Okay, Clyde, let's say I want to set up a couple of colonies on the moon, and I hire you as my science advisor. What would you tell me? Well, Seth, the uh, question I would ask you is how many people do you want to put up there? Because we need to understand well, how much oxygen do you need per day? How much water do you need per day? How are we going to power the outpost? And all these things need to be calculated because if we take an Apollo example, we have to bring everything from this planet. But if we do something different, we can use resources that are available on the moon. Well, when I think of resources, of course, the first thing I'm likely to think of is I want to be able to breathe and I want to be able to have something to drink. That, you know, water, of course, has oxygen in it and with some energy, I suppose you can get that out. But, you know, is there water everywhere on the, on the moon? I, I thought it was only in a few locales. Well, there is water everywhere on the moon, and it, we have to thank our sun for that because the sun continually bombards the surface of the moon with small particles, protons or hydrogen atoms, and they get entrapped in the lunar soil or regolith. So if you just take a portion of the regolith that's been exposed to the sun for some time, you heat it up in a vacuum, you'll see water dripping out of the bottom of it because there is oxygen in the minerals and it combines with the hydrogen that's been implanted by the sun and you can actually get water out of regolith pretty much anywhere on the moon. But we need to know how much. Well, don't we have, you know, a couple of hundred pounds of moon rock sitting in Houston somewhere? I mean, can't we do this experiment without actually sending, I don't know, prospectors to the moon? Well, we have done the experiment. That's how we know that. But the problem is that you have other aspects to take into consideration for whether or not you're going to put your moon base around an Apollo site. And one of those major considerations is, well, how long is the lunar night going to be? And if you're along the equator, then you're you know, dealing with approximately 14 Earth days of sunlight and then 14 Earth days of darkness. Well, you really want a place where you get, <laughs> you get more sunlight than you do in the middle of the moon, which is the part of the moon we've, uh, I guess, explored up until now. It sounds like, yes, if you went to the North or South Pole, you know, you just put a big pole at the pole <laughs> with, with solar collectors <laughs> on the top of it. I mean, you could have that, you know, seeing the sun 24 hours a day, 30 days a month or whatever, right? I mean, why not put this colony at the bottom or the top of the moon? Well, that's exactly right. And that's, that's where we've been looking at putting such a base. In fact, when President Bush gave his vision for space exploration, it was the lunar south pole that became one of the favorite landing sites or the candidate landing sites for putting his envisaged lunar base. But what we don't know is the, is the nature of the regolith that's there. It's very different from where most of the Apollo landing sites were, so we do need to do some exploration precursor missions before we send humans to make sure that that is the place we need to build our infrastructure. Well, uh, aside from, you know, the water, what, what else do you need in order to live the good life in a moon colony? Well, you need food. Can we grow food in one-sixth gravity? in a radiation environment that's very different. How does the radiation affect the quality of the food? And is the regolith actually going to be able to grow the food because there's very little organic material there? However, we have organic uh, makers in terms of the humans. We can recycle. That sounds like the movie The Martian, where the guy kind of recycled in order to grow some food. Now, I believe that Russia is planning on going to the moon to prospect for minerals in about 2020. Well, is that ahead of the plans that ESA has? Is that sooner than they're going to do anything? Or is that, you know, does that come after ESA begins to send hardware lunar-bound? Well, ESA is actually collaborating very closely with the Russians. So ESA is actually building a lot of the hardware that's going to go on the Russian spacecraft for their 2020 mission. But the collaboration that goes on, and the thing that I found to be a little sad, is that up until 2010... ESA and NASA were collaborating very closely and going back to the moon, but since our change of direction, they're no longer doing that. So they're collaborating with, with Russia, and uh, we're along as spectators. 
Well, why is that? I mean, what's the rationale? Why are the Americans not involved in going back to the moon? Uh, space policy. Politics. Politics? Mm-hmm. Uh, not recommendations from the science community? Mm, no, they were pretty much ignored. And it comes down to a budgetary thing, and the rationale was that we have a very finite NASA budget, and it could not develop a lander to actually land on a surface that has a lot of gravity. And the moon, believe it or not, has enough gravity to make life interesting, even though it's one-sixth of our own. I think a lot of people at NASA see the logic for going to the moon because the moon can enable so much more. It can enable Mars much better than just going to an asteroid or going direct to Mars. It allows us to, again, use these resources because we can make rocket fuel out of them. So we don't have to take everything from this planet. We can refuel at the moon on our way to Mars. But Clive, obviously building a base on the moon, no matter who does it, is going to be expensive. So if you were sitting next to somebody in a bus or whatever, and you expounded on this idea, they're likely to ask you, look, you know, what's in it for me or for the planet? I mean, you can talk about more research capabilities and mining for, you know, this, that, or the other, but why should we really do this? Why should we really do this? Well, I go back to my childhood. I had an Apollo moment. People who are younger than me never had their Apollo moment. That's what got me interested in geology. That's what got me interested in planetary science. We see that we have achieved, we have sent humans walking on another planet. Now we're going to do the next step. We're going to achieve humans living and working successfully on another planet. You're inspiring the next generation and generations to come. And plus the fact you're, you're creating wealth for that planet, and not only wealth in terms of money, but in terms of technology that can help the population back on Earth. Well, finally, Clive, if, uh, you know, you got an email five years from now saying, hey, look, would you like to uh, be one of the first colonists on the moon? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, you answered my question. <laughs> you would go. Yeah, my wife probably have something to say about that. But, well, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I may not fit in the spacecraft, but there again. <laughs> you definitely go. Well, I assume there are many people like you. Well, again, blazing a trail, being there, I mean, I've studied Apollo samples for almost 30 years. To actually go and see them in situ, that's how I would get my jollies right there, to be able to go out as a geologist and explore an alien terrain like that. I mean, I just I can't think of anything better than to do that and, and to look back. And after talking to Jack Schmidt from Apollo 17, and, and he says, you know, looking back at Earth, you get the sense of just how small the Earth is, and it gives you that perspective. So when you come back, you start to, to treat it a little differently. Clive Neal, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Oh, it's been fantastic. Thank you very much for listening to me, and uh, I hope we get back to the moon. Clive Neal is a geologist at the University of Notre Dame. Well, as the song goes, everyone's gone to the moon, or just about everyone's planning to go to the moon. Clive Neal says he's in, but you've seen the Apollo-era photos. The moon is a sterile, dry, black-and-white world. Maybe we can use the regolith to create water. Maybe we could build habitats and hunker down. But the viability of long-term colonization requires more. It requires raw materials, such as metals and compounds for making concrete. And the question is, is there anything akin to these resources on the moon? A new study on the chemical composition of the moon may provide some answers. I'm Ed Young. I'm a cosmochemist and a geochemist at UCLA. If there's a cooler title than cosmochemist in science, I'm not sure what it is. Ed Young and his team have studied the chemistry of the moon and compared it to that of the Earth. The results prompted, well, not a new theory so much as a new twist on an old theory about how the moon was formed. Now, the old theory is that it was created when a planetary-sized body named Theia grazed the Earth and broke off a chunk of it. But Dr. Young says that such a glancing blow would leave the moon and the Earth with different chemical compositions, and that's just not the case. Theia was one of as many as 20 rogue bodies orbiting in the early solar system at the time our moon was formed. This place was like a bumper car ride at an amusement park, and collisions were common. It was about 100 million years after the start of the solar system, which means it was about 4.5 billion years ago. And when did the solar system sort of get cleaned out? I mean, when, when, were you, when was it safe to go back onto the surface, <laughs> if you will? Yeah, well, we think, actually, we think the, the moon-forming impact at about 
100 million years after the start of the solar system was perhaps one of the last big events in the solar system with regard to collisions. So about 4.5 billion years ago, the big smash, the big collide. That's right. We have evidence of what the moon is made of, thanks to the Apollo mission. They brought back a couple of hundred pounds of rock, I think. How does that figure in your detective work? Well, the original theory was that as this glancing blow occurred, the moon would be made up mostly of the impactor, Theia, rather than the early Earth. And, and therefore, since every body in the solar system has different chemical signatures, the odds were that the moon and Earth would look very different. But what we did is to analyze pieces of the moon brought back by the Apollo astronauts and compared them with Earth rocks and did it at a very high level of precision. How did you do that? I mean, how, I mean, you can look at them, of course, and maybe they look the same, maybe they look different, but that's that's not really what you're going after. What What is it about these rocks that you look for to determine whether they're pieces of the early Earth or pieces of some big body that slammed into the Earth? All right, so people don't think about this much, but actually 90% by volume of rock is made of oxygen atoms or about half their weight. And oxygen comes with these telltale isotopic compositions. And every body in the solar system has a unique signature isotopic composition of, of oxygen. And so we compared the oxygen isotopes in the moon with the oxygen isotopes in the Earth. And we found that they're absolutely identical to about five parts per million, which is an extraordinary precision. And so this doesn't leave much wiggle room. It really does seem like the moon and the Earth however they formed, are well mixed. In other words, they come from the same material. Okay, but what you're saying by that is that we go to the moon, we pick up these rocks, we bring them back, we look at them, and they're just like rocks you'd find here on the Earth. So consequently, the moon is made of former stuff from the Earth. But couldn't it have been that Theia was a body that was made out of the same sort of stuff as the Earth was, and it's actually Theia rock you're looking at on the moon? It's conceivable, so part of our study was to evaluate that possibility statistically. So what we did was to look at all manner of computer simulations of collisions between different bodies in the solar system and the odds of two bodies being absolutely identical to this level of precision are very, very low. Well, let's fast forward then. You still buy into the collision scenario, I take it, that the early Earth had a smash up with somebody, but when you recreated the collision, you changed the parameters of that collision to make it, well, I guess, more violent. Why'd you do that? Well, it's the only way we can make the two bodies identical. What we really need is a collision that's so vigorous, so forceful, that the bodies become one big blob of molten rock. Imagine a, a blob of lava floating in space. And therefore, they would completely intermingled and well mixed. And then a piece of that blob spalls off to form the moon. So this is a somewhat of a different view that you'd have a collision that was that violent. So does that mean that this was a collision in which, I don't know, the two bodies were moving more rapidly with respect to one another? Or, or did they just hit head on? How, how did you make it more violent? It's, it's the head on aspect of it. And also the size we think it's possible that Theia could have been about as large as the Earth. And there are other groups making detailed models of these kinds of collisions. And what we're saying is the chemistry is telling them you're on the right track. You want to look at these kinds of very energetic collisions. So let me try and picture this then. So shortly after the solar system finally gets underway, very shortly, you have this head-on collision of two objects more or less about the same size. And, and they essentially destroy one another, making a big molten blob in orbit around the sun, then, then what happens? Where does the moon come from? Part of the story is that the bodies, everything in space rotates. And so the proto-Earth was rotating, we think, rather rapidly. And when you combine a collision with something rotating very fast, it can spin off material. And so the moon is some of the splash that spun off after the collision. Now, Ed, this new model of how the moon formed, obviously, it's based on the composition of the moon, which sounds pretty much like the composition of rock I would dig up here in my backyard. If that's the case, this might have some consequences for future colonization of the moon. Well, that's an interesting point. So one of the spin-off conclusions that comes from a study like ours is a history of water on the Earth and the moon. So a giant impact like the one that we're talking about would have been rather effective in eliminating water from both Theia and the Earth right after the collision. You can imagine the essentially steam coming off this ball of, of molten rock. And so that implies that the Earth acquired its water rather late. 
And if the moon has any water, it acquired that water late after the impact as well. What about raw materials? It sounds to me that if you can mine it on the Earth, you might be able to mine it on the moon, given that they're the same inventory of you know, elements or compounds or whatever else. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the, the, the surface of the moon is essentially the same rock as that that makes up the ocean basins, the floors of the oceans. This is a rock called basalt. So anything you can get from rocks like basalt here on Earth, you could get from rocks on the moon. Okay, well, that's encouraging, isn't it? I mean, it, I, I, maybe we can build cities on the moon in the future. Maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> you don't sound convinced. <laughs> Well, finally, Ed, I, I have to say you have one of the cooler titles in science. Uh, you're a geochemist, but you're also a cosmochemist. Right. Uh, <laughs> what, what are the big questions a cosmochemist works on? Cosmochemist is actually has a formal definition. It's a geochemist who works on the chemistry of meteorites, in fact, technically. And it has to do with trying to use the chemistry of meteorites and other objects in the solar system to unravel how the solar system formed. Ed Young, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Sure, thank you. Ed Young is a cosmochemist and a geochemist at UCLA. Well, you heard him say that the moon might have water, and Clive Neal said that the moon is bone dry. Both may be true. I mean, if there is any water on the moon, it came from asteroids or comets just like happened to the Earth. But, of course, it wouldn't stay on the surface. If you had a little pool of water on the surface, you know, the sunlight would immediately cause it to evaporate into space. There is some ice at the poles, but if you're not living at the poles, that won't help you too much. If the moon has any substantial amounts of water, it's deep underground where it doesn't do you very much good. So Dr. Neal is correct that if we were to live on the moon, we'd have to make water out of the regolith. Yeah, either that or bring it with you, which is very expensive. So indeed, I mean, you know, you have hydrogen caused by the ultraviolet light hitting the moon. Of course, you have all that oxygen in the rock, so you just burn it and you get water. Now, the oxygen also played a role in Dr. Young's research. It did, because he used isotopes of oxygen to prove that the moon and the Earth were made of basically the same stuff. Now, when we talk about whether or not the moon has raw materials, you, you asked that of Dr. Young, and he said that it might have basalt, like what's at the bottom of our ocean, but is that sufficient raw material to build a moon colony out of? Yeah, I think uh, any civilization that has to run exclusively on basalt is probably not very interesting. We use basalt for things like, you know, cobblestones, but in fact, there's a lot of good stuff on the moon we could use. Uh, there's silicon all over the place for your high-tech equipment, but there's also lots of iron, manganese, aluminum, all the stuff you need for your cities. Well, it sounds as though there's enough political will and even the raw materials to start printing those greetings from the moon vacation postcards. But ethically, is it the right thing to do? Protecting our moon from biological and commercial contamination next. It's the Crater Good on Big Picture Science. So it sounds as though we're going to the moon again. Wonder what the Apollo astronauts might think of these plans. Well, mission accomplished. Earth, here we come. I kind of teared up with that goodbye. Not a good idea in a spacesuit, I admit. Well, you are the last man to step off the lunar surface. It's historic. Well, we spent 22 hours outside in the buggy. That's a record. And popping wheelies off the crater was fun, too. We got more air than Neil and Buzz. Shh, Houston's listening. What are they going to do? We're headed home. Come in. Come in, Apollo 17. I told you. Uh, we copy, Houston. Nice job, gentlemen. You performed the longest EVA in one mission. You gathered samples of lunar highland material. You made America proud. Thank you, sir. We're looking forward to coming home. To dinners you don't have to squeeze from tubes, to better options when nature calls. And Wayne Newton's 8-track drops at Christmas. We just need one more thing from you. Yeah, what would that be? Well, uh, we, uh, we need you to go back. Uh, Houston, can you repeat that? It sounded like you said... We need you to go back to the moon. So, uh, if you could just turn the ship... You want us to go back? I know it's kind of sudden, 
Well, how do you think I feel? I mean, there goes our deposit on the marching band. Although I think we could probably donate the fruit baskets and... Mission Control, we completed the mission successfully. You did? Too successfully. Now, everyone wants a piece of lunar real estate. Our intelligence says that China is forming its own space administration. They've developed freeze-dried Chow Fun. And the Europeans, they're designing Couture spacesuits. What's the time frame for these missions? Hang on, I can't seem to read my own notes here. Wait a minute. Oh, 50 years, give or take. What? You're asking us to return to the moon and sit there so that we can stake a claim when the Chinese and Europeans arrive? I know, but Apollo has been too successful. Now it's gotten complicated. We should have gone with plan A and filmed the whole thing on that Arizona soundstage. Anyway, the point is, if we leave now, we're giving up the moon for good. You want us to stay on the moon for 50 years? With all due respect, sir, has mission lost its in mind, sir? No, you don't need to stay for 50 years. I mean, that would be lunacy. <laughs> and, and no, just until we launch Apollo 18. Apollo 18? But we're the final Apollo mission. Well, actually, we've had a parallel Apollo mission going as a backup. We launch next week, and America's presence on the moon will be uninterrupted. Willing to stay one more week to make history? <laughs> Again? Well, I guess seven more days of turkey paste won't kill us. We'll go back to the moon. Oh, and uh, one more thing, Commander Cernan. Yes, sir. No more wheelies in the buggy, okay? Well, if all goes as the Chinese and the Europeans have proposed, if humans do colonize the moon, wheelies on its surface will be nothing compared to the environmental disturbances to come. Sending up spaceship after spaceship filled with construction materials, the erection of buildings, the eventual human habitation, and all the human habits that come with it. And if the commercial sector gets involved, well, are you ready for billboards and neon vacancy signs in our satellite's craters? Well, luckily, there are international restrictions on how we treat our neighboring solar system bodies. Planetary protection guidelines that trace back to the UN Outer Space Treaty of 1967 and biological considerations that date all the way back to the Sputnik era. We wanted to be sure that our missions didn't contaminate the moon or bring possible contaminants from the moon back to Earth. Now, we think that the moon is sterile, but does that mean that anything goes there? No, says biologist Margaret Race, a senior scientist in the field of planetary protection at the SETI Institute. And while the 2030 timetable for the proposed colony seems like a long way off, consider this. The pioneers who drove covered wagons over miles and miles of harsh terrain would never have imagined that just a few dozen years later, they would be able to cross the same wilderness in the comfort of a railroad sleeping car. In other words, a lot can change in just a couple dozen years, and now is the time we should be thinking about how we might protect the moon from future prospectors, scientific or commercial. The Outer Space Treaty actually thinks about forward contamination, what you might bring with you, hitchhikers that are terrestrial, and back contamination, what you might bring back if you have a round-trip mission, because we don't want to bring anything to Earth that could become an invasive species or some sort of pest. How did the Apollo missions then protect themselves? The Apollo missions had actually quite a bit in the way of planetary protection, but mostly for the samples that were brought back, they actually used glove boxes. The astronauts themselves were in quarantine for almost a month. And tests were done from Apollo 11, the time that we first landed on the moon, through Apollo 14, asking the question, could there be life up there and was there a problem with astronauts being infected by anything? After that number of missions and a lot of careful study, it was determined that, no, there's no moon life up there. So planetary protection for the humans was no longer necessary after Apollo 14. But we still do maintain quarantine and containment for the materials that are brought back because you also don't want to contaminate the samples. I've seen those quarantine trailers that the astronauts had to sit in, and they're tiny. They're the size of maybe two VW Bugs. Mm -hmm. They're actually an Airstream trailer that was uh, <laughs> modified. Actually considered that the astronauts found those roomy because the Apollo capsules were smaller. They finally got off into something twice the size. They thought, oh, I can stretch out here. Yeah. You say that this is an international agreement. Is it a legally binding agreement? Yes, it's legally binding like many other things that are hard to see how they'd be enforceable. There's not a 
Planetary Protection Police. There's often a joke about that. Um, there are over 100 signatories to the Outer Space Treaty. Planetary protection has many different facets, including no planting flags, no sovereignty on another body. Wait, no planting flags, but the Americans planted a flag, didn't they? Yes, we planted a flag, but we didn't claim sovereignty. We didn't say we own it. So when we went up there to the moon, it was for science exploration. Is China a signatory? China is definitely a signatory, as are the Russians. The Russians and the Americans were among the first to sign. Knowing what we know now about the moon and that we believe that there is no life on the moon, what would the concerns be with regard to planetary protection? In other words, how do you measure environmental impact now on the moon now that we've already done a reconnaissance about what might be living there? Okay. So a treaty is not a static thing. Revisions happen all the time to treaties and laws. Um, and so with planetary protection, we went from a very great concern about uh, whether there might be life on, on the moon to saying, oh, well, we know there's not life on the moon, so now it is lower down in categories. So there are categories of real concern. Mars, of course, is one that's of great concern, and we take the strictest precautions when we go to a place like Mars. So on the moon right now, it is actually a category two, two out of five, and the two says that you still have to apply to your planetary protection officer, whichever country you might be, before launch. And it's basically a plan from pre-launch to the end of the mission that says where your spacecraft will be and what will be the end impact of it. So, Margaret, the, the Chinese are on the moon now. They have um, a lander and a rover, and they plan to send more in the next couple of years. Um, how will they go about executing the planetary protection requirements? And how might the Europeans do it if they do send humans up there in 2030? Okay. Um, there's a lot of interaction internationally among the scientific community. And COSPAR, the Committee on Space Research, is a group of scientists who um, work on having a kind of consistency across these regulations. Not that we do it the same way, but we agree to these same policies. The Chinese, I don't know how the Chinese are doing their planetary protection in particular, but there's quite a bit of interaction between the NASA planetary protection officer and the officer in the European Space Agency, the Japanese many, many countries. Uh, as you know, our Congress has said that we can't have those kinds of direct interactions with scientists in China. So there's uh, not as much information about what they will do. But as a signatory, it's likely that they will be careful at some level. Can you give us a scenario of a negative environmental impact on the moon? It sounds as though biology is out of the picture now. So what else could go wrong in terms of planetary protection? It's not all necessarily going wrong. So, for instance, when the Google Lunar X Prize was going to the moon, there was concern about whether or not it would be okay for a commercial group to go up and take samples off of or go interfere with a human heritage site. Think of that footprint on the moon. Okay, is a footprint something that's important? Well, it is to us, but that's got nothing to do with forward contamination. So there's more than just the science that we're protecting. So they actually looked at all of those things, and NASA and agencies keep track of a lot of the things that they do up there. They have information on where the rover might be. They even know what was jettisoned before they took off to return to the Earth. So, for instance, on the moon, there are pieces of hardware that have been up there in moon conditions, weathering away for 40 plus years. Scientists would love to know how the materials have done. And so scientifically, you might want to break, back, break off a piece and bring it back for science. Knowing where it is would be important. Turns out that before they launched back, there were a lot of biological materials left in plastic bags up there diapers, astronauts' diapers, and waste materials, for instance. And so it would be very interesting to go up there and find out, to sample them, and to find out whether things have continued to live inside those plastic bags. So there's, there's scientific reasons you might want to know those things. And they don't have to do with life on the moon, except for the materials we brought with us. But Margaret, wouldn't the act of depositing plastic bags filled with the astronauts' diapers be considered forward contamination, biological contamination? 
It possibly was. And again, when we went to the moon with the Apollo program, there were different laws, a different understanding about microbes, and uh, a different indication of the kinds of technology that you might use sampling things up there. So you want really thick plastic, perhaps? I don't know. It would be interesting to find out what's up there. Well, what if we succeed in growing life on the moon? If we are able to extract water from the regolith and then plant plants. <laughs> Chances are you, it won't be on the surface of the moon. It would be inside of some sort of artificial habitat or greenhouse, if you will. And is that a loophole in the planetary protection requirements? Oh, no, not at all. Consider it like um, requirements for not doing water pollution. When we send a submarine down, there's ways that we can make sure that it is minimally contaminating. So it's the same thing. You couldn't grow plants and other things on the surface of the moon anyway. The environment is not conducive to that. So if we want to grow things, if we want to use the ices that might be up there, we'll have to bring them indoors. And those are artificial habitats, artificial life support systems. Do you see this as dividing the considerations for planetary protection dividing into two categories at least. One is the scientific considerations because there are scientific questions and the other are almost ethical questions about, as you said, you know, not disturbing a, a heritage site, but also this idea that, you know, maybe we want to keep the bodies in the solar system pristine. That's interesting. If you want to keep them pristine, don't launch into space because anytime we go any place, there will be contamination from Earth. It's impossible or near impossible to totally sterilize something. Practically, there will be things on a spacecraft when it goes. When you asked um, that there might be more consideration than science exploration and you went for the other ethical, uh, ethical I thought you were going to say exploitation or uses. It turns out that the Outer Space Treaty is written to provide for exploration and use for the peaceful benefits of humankind. What we're facing now is the question of what happens when someone wants to go up and put up a space hotel so or commercialization. commercialize things. Right now, the Outer Space Treaty has not written any of the framework or the regulations for exploitation or use of outer space resources. We haven't done any uses beyond low Earth or geostationary orbit. So when we look at the moon, or we look at Mars or comets or Europa or any other body out there, we have to say, what is it we want? And that's where some of the ethical questions start to come up. What would it mean if, for instance, people went and put up a big advertising sign in the middle of a crater on the moon that we could see from down here? That doesn't seem like a right thing to do, but scientifically at this point, we know that that's not a scientific problem. But there's something that says you don't go and deface the Grand Canyon or you don't break off pieces of the pyramids and bring them home in your suitcase. So there, there's more to it than just the science or even the commercial uses and the peaceful uses and exploitation, if you will, of resources for humankind. Margaret Race, thank you so much for speaking with us. Sure. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Margaret Race is a biologist and senior scientist in planetary protection at the SETI Institute. Well, what we've heard in the show, the moon, it's still making a siren call to Earthlings, if not to the U.S., at least to the Chinese, the Europeans, and the Russians. But the goals today are ostensibly different, more science, even habitation. However, as James Oberg points out, space still has geopolitical overtones, and those remain big drivers. And Margaret Race notes that we're in a whole new ballgame in a sense. Today, the ethical implications extend beyond just biological contamination, but to the aesthetics of colonization. It's no longer the Wild West. Well, thanks to those who put up with our lunacy to help produce this show, Gary Niederhoff, Barbara Vance, and our intern, Aaron Ross. Also, thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky-David and Sammy David, 
Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to the greater good. If you'd like to moon over more Big Picture Science episodes, well, you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. If you're a podcast listener, but you prefer listening to over-the-air radio because, well, there's some chance that the signal might reach you by bouncing off the moon, Check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like this show. Oh, and if you listen by using iTunes, we invite you to leave a review about Big Picture Science on our iTunes page. And to reach us directly with your comments, well, just throw in some faint praise and email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. One more. Just one more, okay? Okay, you can do one more wheelie in the buggy, but that's all.